Hi, welcome to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about the sampling distribution of the mean. Okay, so we've been learning about sampling distributions in general, um, but the sampling distribution of the mean, sometimes called the sampling distribution of the sample mean, um, is a special case of it. And it's it has a lot of really interesting properties that, that are going to come in handy over and over again. So it's worth really looking into detail. Um, so this is just me. It's not like all of statistics. But I'm going to call it the SDOM for short, sampling distribution of the mean, um, just so that you'll know what I'm talking about um, without me having to say sampling distribution of the mean every single time. Um, we're going to use simulations online to see some principles that might arise out of, um, see some principles and regularities that arise um, about the shape of the SDOM, the mean of the SDOM, as well as the standard deviation of the SDOM. And basically, the idea here is that shape, center, and spread really summarize the sampling distribution of the mean. Then we're also going to talk about how these principles of the SDOM that we looked at through the simulations have also been proven in the central limit theorem. Uh, we're not going to go over the uh, big formal proofs, although you can find those online. Um, but I want you to see how these two connect to each other. And then finally, we're going to compare um, the population distributions that we've looked at before, sample distributions, as well as sampling distribution of the mean. So this is a new kind of distribution. And then finally, we're going to recap and see if we've answered some of these questions that remain from last time. OK, so remember, this is a special case um, of the general uh, method for simulating a sampling distribution. So let's go over that and fill in how the SDOM, or the sampling distribution of the mean, right, is um, a special case of regular old sampling distributions. All right, so first step, take a random sample of size n from the population. That does not change with the SDOM. For um, all sampling distributions, that's always the same step. The, uh, the real difference is really in step number two. Here, we're computing the summary statistic. Here, um, the thing that makes sampling distribution of the mean special is that the particular sampling uh, summary statistic that you compute here is the mean. Okay, And then you'll plot that mean. So we've actually looked at SDOMs before, um, but we just called them sampling distributions of, um, and now we're going to look at all the different properties of sampling distributions of the mean. And then you repeat one and two many, many times. That step doesn't change. And then finally, display and examine the distribution of summary statistic. That step doesn't change either. So the only thing that we've really sort of nailed down in the SDOM is this one. And it's just that because it's a sampling distribution of the mean, all you do is you find the means and you plot those. It's a distribution entirely made up of tiny little means. OK. So now we're going to go on to uh, looking at some simulations on the computer. So if you want to type in this on your, um, in your browser, uh, go ahead and do that. It's uh, onlinestatbook.com slash stat underscore sim slash sampling underscore dist. Now, um, their onlinestatbook.com actually has a lot of cool statistic simulations. So you might want to also explore some of those. So this is what it should look like. Um, if you go to this website right here, and if you hit begin, it should start a Java applet that looks something like this. Okay, so let's just go over what uh, these different things mean. Nope. I'll move it to the middle a little bit. Okay, so first things first. Um, up on top, it says parent population. It's just a shun, but um, so parent population. So this is what 
uh, this computer simulation shows you is a parent, a potential parent population. But you could actually, if you have a mouse, you could draw anything you want. And so it doesn't have to look like this, you know, it could, could look as different as you want it to look. So you can make any parent population, right? Ta-da! So this is a five mode distribution. Um, also, if you click on this uh, little, uh, a little bar, um, you could see different ones that are already sort of pre-programmed for you. So there's the normal distribution that looks like that, the uniform distribution, right? Skewed distribution, and custom just gives it to you blank, and then you could draw whatever you want. All right? So um, here you could paint any parent distribution you want, and this is the distribution from which our sampling uh, Sampling distribution will pull out a random sample. Okay, and whenever you draw a distribution here, it'll show you what the mean is. So the mean is uh, shown in, in blue, that little blue mark, 17.58. The median, shown in pink, right there. And uh, the standard deviation, so this shows you a, um, one, one standard deviation sort of to the uh, negative side and the positive side from the mean. And also um, how much skew it has and the kurtosis as well. Something we learned to calculate um, back when we were talking about the normal distribution. All right, so we could also uh, go ahead and uh, let's, let's use uh, normal for now. And here, we could see that the skew and kurtosis are perfectly zero. The mean and median are the same value, they're right on top of each other, and the standard deviation is five, so five on each side. And you could sort of see, if you go five, five, and five, you've gotten probably 90% of that distribution, just like a normal distribution should. All right, now let's go on to the steps um, outlined in how to simulate a sampling distribution. So the first step was to pull out a, a random sample of size n from the parent population, right? And so what we can do is we could tell uh, this little Java applet um, what our n should be. And so we could say, give me an n of 16, right? So it's going to pull out 16. And here we could actually um, ask for a variety of different um, different summary statistics, but because we're talking about the SDOM or the sampling distribution of the mean, let's choose mean. And now, if you hit animated, it'll show you what it looks like to pull out one sample of size 16 and find the mean. Okay, so here hit animated. It's pulling out 16 randomly selected. Uh, data points from the population. It finds the mean of that, which is this little uh, blue, blue uh, notch there, and then drops that mean here. So we keep track of just the means, right? And so let's do that again. So it's gonna pull out 16 data points, find the mean right there, and then drop that down. And so we're keeping track of all those means, right? And let's do it one more time. Pulling out 16, finds the mean, drops that down. Okay, so here our sampling distribution is really small, but the nice thing about um, this, little, uh, this little simulation is that it'll do, let's say, five different samples for you and just drop down five means, right? So let me show you that. So it, it pulled out five samples like of 16 and did all that stuff, but without, you know, without showing you pulling it out because it's sort of slow. And then it just dropped down the five means. And in fact, you could do a thousand of those. So this time it pulled out um, 16 a thousand times and um, put the means down, right? And it could even do 10,000, right? And so we could keep hitting 10,000. Now, it might seem as though this is not changing. What this is is frequency, so how frequent a particular mean is. And so even though the frequency is going up, the shape is really not changing very much. Now, let's look at this distribution of means. 
It has a skew that's very close to zero and a kurtosis that's very close to zero. And in fact, this looks very much like a normal distribution. If you could imagine sort of three of these little steps going out, that's about 95, 99% of the entire distribution, right? And here we see that the mean is very similar to the mean here, right? And so here the mean is 16.01 and here the mean is 16. So we're already starting to see, ah, some of those things we talked about earlier, um, we see them in this uh, simulation, right? So that's good. But the question is this, maybe it makes sense that, oh, your sampling distribution of means would be normal if your parent population is normal, but what if your parent population wasn't normal? For instance, what if it was uniform, right? then what would a distribution of means look like, right? And so let's pull out 16 and find the mean. And let's do that 10,000 times and another 10,000. Okay, so here we have 20,001 uh, different, simu uh, different simulated little experiments, right? And we have all these means. And what do we see? we see that the means are still very similar, right? 16 and 15.98. Not only that, but we see that it's approximately normal. Imagine l this little space going out three times. That's about 99% of this entire distribution. The skew is very close to zero. The kurtosis is also very close to zero. Hmm. So, so far, for normal parent populations, as well as uniform parent populations, we see that the sampling distribution of the mean is very close to normal, right? Our, our notion of what normal distributions are. And we know lots about normal distributions, right? All right, so what about skew? What about skew, right? Would we expect this sampling distribution of means, would, would we expect that also to be normal? Or maybe a little bit skewed? So let's uh, animate one just to see. Here, they pulled out 16, drop down the mean, right? Hmm, the, the mean, uh, the mean is, uh, is sort of close to where the mean is up here, but will it be normal looking or will it be sort of skewed looking? Um, let's do it five times, right? Another five times, another five times. Let's do it 10,000 times and another 10,000. And what do we see? Hmm. So although the skew is a little bit greater than uh, it used to be in other, in previous ones, this really looks more normal than anything else. And if we did another 10,000, another 10,000, it doesn't really seem to change very much and it still looks pretty normal. If you take this little space, this standard deviation, and go out about three times, that's about 99% of this distribution. And um, not only that, but we see that this mean, 8.07, is very similar to the mean of the parent population, 8.08. .08. And so we're seeing that even though the original parent population is not normal, the sampling distribution of the mean, or the SDOM, tends to look very normal, especially if you have a lot of means, right? So if you simulated it a lot, so law of large numbers can be invoked. And now let's do a custom one. We could do some crazy ones here, right? What about something like this? Would we expect this to be, uh, to have a normal uh, sampling distribution of the mean? I don't know, let's try it. So I'm gonna animate one, Here's 16 data points. It finds the mean, drops it down. I'm going to do that 10,000 times and another 10,000. And what do you know? Here we have 16.1, 16, .1, 16 uh, as the mean. So similar means. Very low, uh, very uh, close to zero for skew, very close to zero for kurtosis, right? So this is looking very, very normal, right? Like take the three, go out three, 99%. I mean, this is very interesting. And so you could try a whole bunch of different, you know, crazy things. And, you know, I dare you to sort of try to draw one that won't give you 
a uh, normally distributed sampling distribution of the mean. What about this one? It's like a, you know, uh, like a sort of like a re the shadow of the parabola or something, right? What about that, right? And let's skip directly to you know ten thousand, right? Oh wait, let's clear this. Okay, now let's skip directly to 10,000. And what do you know? Even for this crazy distribution, we see that the sampling distribution of the mean looks fairly normal. The mean is almost always like right on top of the mean of the parent population. And, um, and another thing that I want you to notice is that when the standard deviation is, uh, you know, here let's say 11.66, here, the standard deviation is much smaller, right? And so um, there are a couple of things we've already learned from using these um, simulations. All right. All right, so let's um, think about using these simulations to see the principles behind the shape of the SDOM. One of the things we saw is that sort of no matter what the shape of the parent population what do we find sdom tends to be normal but wait a second we really only tested that for n of 16 right Maybe 16 is somehow like special. Maybe there's, um, maybe what about for um, like n's of two? Is, is this also going to be normal? Well, let's try that. Oh, look, look at what we see. When the n is very small, this does not tend to be normal. What about an n of five? Okay, so that looks a little more normal, but not really that nice normal distribution we saw with 16, right? What about 10? Okay, now that's starting to look a little bit more normal, right? So what we see is that as long as n tends to be reasonably large, and you know, I don't know if there's a magic number, but um, as long as n tends to be pretty large, um, you tend to get a normal sampling distribution of the mean, right? So that's definitely one thing. So there's a couple of um, so there's a couple of conditions. Conditions. So these conditions have to be fulfilled before this is true. Um, so samples n, the sample size, must be reasonably large. So two is too small. Five even is a little too small. Ten, it starts looking better, but you know, whatever reasonably large is, it should be reasonably large. A lot of times people use the rule like 40 to be, any un of 40 to be like reasonably large, right? But you know, that's, that's just a rule of thumb. Okay, what else? Um, does it matter, uh, so we looked at sample size, that might be an important thing, but what else might matter? Um, does it matter uh, what the, uh, how many times we sample? So let's see, um, let, let's clear the bottom three, and uh, let's only do it for five. Right? So if we only did the simulation five times, then, um, then we wouldn't get a normal distribution, right? Only when we start doing it like a thousand times, or, um, or 10,000 times rather, or 20,000 times, does it start looking more and more normal, right? So it also s seems to be that the more simulations we have, sort of the better. So if using simulations must have a large number of simulations. 
So, um, so the this is true only if n is reasonably large, and only if you have a very large number of simulations. If you're using simulations, right? And so, um, although this is uh, this is this is really helpful. There are some conditions that you have to meet before you could invoke this. Um, great. So we learned some things from using simulations about the shape of the SDOM. OK, so what about the principles behind the center or mean of the SDOM? OK, well, one, th one of the things we found was um, generally the mean of the SDOM, and I'm going to show you a new notation for this. The mean of the SDOM is, uh, is shown as mu sub x bar, because it's the mu of a bunch of means, right? The mean of the SDOM tends to equal the mean of the population. Sometimes I'll say parent population, but that means the same thing as the population. Um, and that is symbolized by the mu, just plain old mu. Now, um, now notice that it, this is using mu, because remember, SDOM and all sampling distributions are theoretical distributions, right? And theoretical um, distributions tend to be uh, notated just like populations, right? Um, now, does it have to be that, are there any conditions, right? So I'll put conditions. Does n matter? So first we'll test this. We want to know if it matters the size of our sample. OK. So let me clear the lower three. Let's do uh, skewed, right? So let's see if it matters whether the size of our sample matters. Um, let's try for n equals 2. And uh, let's do that five times or 10,000 times. All right. So n equals 2, and this does not look very normal. But the mean is still very close to that mean, right? So that's interesting to note. What about for uniform, right? So n is 2. Is the mean very similar to this mean? Hmm. Yeah, it tends to be very similar. OK, so for small n's, the means tend to be equal to each other. What about for n's of 5, which is also still pretty small? Let's try 10,000. OK, 16 and 16, still pretty good. What about for skewed? Let's try 10,000. OK, pretty good. All right, we're seeing something. What about for very large ends? Let's see about that, right? OK, 8.07, 8.08, right? Um, what about for some crazy custom distributions, right? OK, 15.06, 15.05, pretty good. Hmm. OK, so for both small and large ends, um, the means tend to be similar. Uh, let's try with this crazy distribution and n of 2. 15.04, 15.05. Hmm. So we're seeing something here. We're seeing that sort of no matter the size of the n, the means tend to be equal. So does, does n matter? No. For both small and smaller and larger n's, oh, larger n's, um, mu sub x bar equals mu. That's nice, right? So it's like we don't have to um, make sure that we have a large n in order to invoke this principle. OK, what about um, 
does number of simulations matter? Well, let's go see. So let's clear the bottom three. Let's say we only did five. If we only did five simulations, we get 15.61, uh, which is not that far off from 15.05. Let's clear that again and do another five. Here we get 11.22, uh, and here we get 15.05, right? So um, here we see that, well, maybe the number of actual simulations does matter. Here we get 15.79, which is not so bad. Let's clear it and do it again. 16.47, Yeah, so we're seeing that, you know, if you only have a small number of simulations, then um, you're not really sure if it's really, really close or not. It might, it might vary a little. Usually it's sort of in the right range, but um, having, having more seems to give you that assurance. Yeah. But let's try with a larger N. With a larger N, we see, okay, 15.05, 15.03, hmm, okay. Let's clear that again. I'm going to do that simulation five times. 15.03, 15.05, clear it again, hit five. 16.51, hmm, okay, so that's off. Let's do it one more time. 16. Okay, so we do see that number of simulations matter. Yes. Having a large number of simulations gives, let's say, more accuracy in mu, mu sub x bar, so in the sample mean. So by accuracy, I mean more of a match between um, the mean of your sampling distribution as well as your uh, population mean. Okay, so n doesn't matter, but the number of simulations does. All right, so what about the standard deviation of the SDOM? And um, we talked about it very briefly in one of the problems before, but saying standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean is really long, right? And we actually end up using this standard deviation a lot. This is going to be something that comes up over and over again. And because of that, we give it a special name so that we could shortcut saying standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean, right? And the special name is this. It's standard error, right? That's what it's called. Deviation is the word for, you know, how far be the sort of distance between um, the mean and some data point, right? That's the deviation. Um, error is often used um, sort of interchangeably with that term. Um, how, how off are you from some target? The target here being the mean, right? So it doesn't mean that we've made an error, like an actual mistake. It just means, oh, how, how off are these data points? Okay, so that's why it's called standard error. And whenever we say standard error, what we really mean is this whole thing, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean. So we don't use the word standard error for any other uh, standard deviations. For instance, if we calculate the standard deviation of a sample or a population, we wouldn't call it standard error. This term is only reserved for this concept. Okay, so what did we learn about the standard error when we did some of our simulations? Well, um, let's look again. with a special focus on standard deviation. So let's go to the normal distribution and let's start with the lowest, uh, uh, let's start with the N of five, right? And uh, let's take 10,000 simulations. And we see that, you know, it's, it's fairly normal, right? It's fairly normal, has a very similar mean, has um, a skew and kurtosis of close to zero, right? So this is looking very normal to us. But what is one thing that you notice between this and this? 
this one seems a lot sort of like pointier or sharper, right? So this one seems um, to be have a small, so this standard error seems to be smaller than the population standard deviation, right? And let's see if that's true for different values of n. So now let's try n of uh, n equals 10. And I'll just skip straight to 10,000 simulations and hit another 10,000. Um, so we see, once again, it's nice and normal. Skew and kurtosis are close to zero, similar mean. But we see that the standard deviation here is still bigger than the standard deviation down here, right? And not only that, but we see that this is even, even pointier than it was before, even sharper, right? Um, now let's try for n of 16, right? And here, I mean, I think it's hard to notice, but it's, it's even, even pointier, right? It's even uh, more like narrow in terms of its standard deviation, right? Um, and if you notice the numbers, these numbers keep going lower and lower. Before, for n equals 5, the standard deviation was 2.23. But for n equals 10, the standard deviation is 1.61. Now, obviously, this standard deviation has not changed at all. Now let's look at standard deviation of n equals 25. Here, the standard error is 1, right? So it's, it's really small, right? Um, and so one thing we see is that basically the standard error is all, always smaller than the popu uh, parent population. But not only that, how small it is tends, seems to be related to n, right? And so let's see if that's true with other, um, other formations, right? And so maybe we'll draw a custom one. So here's a trimodal distribution. And uh, let's try with, uh, maybe this time we'll start off with the biggest n, so n of 25. And let's see. So the standard deviation is 1.71, and this is, uh, you know, looking pretty normal. But what about n equals 10? Is, it, is the standard error going to be smaller than 1.7? And, it, and it's not. It's, it's fatter, right? And, and that's what we saw before. As n is smaller and smaller, the standard error is bigger and bigger, right? So there's a bigger spread. And let's try with n equals 5. We should predict that it should be even bigger, right? And that's what we see. And with n equals 2, now the standard error is really big, right? And so um, maybe we'll try with one other, uh, one other distribution, the uniform distribution. Uh, let's, let's go from small to big now. So now, when n is small and getting bigger and bigger and bigger, what should happen to standard error? Standard error should get smaller and smaller and smaller. They have an inverse, they seem to have an inverse relationship. All right. So here we start off with a pretty wide looking standard deviation. This, you want to look at this red part right here. It's pretty wide, right? 6.79. But remember, 6.79 is still smaller than 9.52. So it's always smaller than the parent population, but always, um, but n matters, right? n matters. What about n equals 5? Now it's 4 point something. n equals 10. Now it's 3. n equals 25. Now it's 1.91, right? So, so we see a couple of things here. So standard error, and to write standard error, we would uh, write uh, sigma, because remember, the sampling distribution is a theoretical distribution, sub x bar, to indicate it's the, it's the standard deviation of a bunch of means, right, is always smaller than standard deviation of population, right? And we call that just sigma, right? 
So this seems to be true. Um, conditions. Does n matter? Yes, n does matter. And how does it matter? Um, so larger the n, the smaller the standard error. Now, obviously, you could also write this as um, the smaller the n, the larger the standard error. Same idea. And do the number of simulations matter? Does it help us become more accurate? All right, so let's see. So let's say we only had uh, five, right? Um, what is the standard deviation? Well, it's still smaller. Um, what about the n mattering? Does n matter? Oops. Let me just do five, right? So standard deviation is almost always smaller. That's true. Um, so standard deviation is almost always smaller, but, um, but that's still sort of rough, right? It's like we don't know exactly how small. So um, it's sort of like, let's see. Does number of simulations matter? Well, this is a pretty vague idea, right? It just tends to be smaller. Um, not really for the vague idea that the standard error is smaller than the population standard deviation. So the simulations don't really matter. But we probably want to get more precise than that. This is pretty, uh, pretty general to just say, oh, the standard error is smaller than the standard deviation of, of the population. It'd be nice to know exactly how much smaller, right? All right. And that's where the central limit theorem comes in. So although we've looked at it through simulations, that's an empirical method of looking at um, at what the properties of the sampling distribution of the mean look like. Um, but what the central limit theorem did was it formalized those things. Like people observed that this is true, um, that the shape tends to be normal as n is large, um, that the center uh, tends to be similar between the SDOM as well as the population. And they also saw that the spread tends to be smaller in the SDOM than in the population particularly as n goes up. But um, the central limit theorem is a formal proof of that idea. Um, I'm not going to go over the proof, but I'll just go over what it ends with. So the central limit theorem sort of ends with this. Um, as sample size increases, the shape of SDOM becomes more normal. Oops. I should say approximates normality. Because it's not that it's like being built and becoming more normal, like transforming, but it approximates um, normal, normality, right? So as n goes up, the shape becomes more normal, right? So this is just a, a formal way of saying it, and they've actually proven this mathematically. And note, uh, although it's not part of the central limit theorem, one thing to note is that the population isn't necessarily the same uh, shape as the SDOM. The SDOM is, always, uh, is almost always normal, as long as sample size is large. But that doesn't mean that populations are always normal, right? And that's helpful to us because we know the, the shape of the SDOM, even though we don't know anything about the shape of the population. Okay, what about center? Well, the center, um, the principle of the center is this. Uh, 
the mean of the SDOM is equal to the mean of the population. And does n matter? No, it doesn't. What about spread? Well, here, um, the standard error, standard error is equal to the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n. The actual easier way to remember this is that the variance, the standard, uh, so the variance of the SDOM is actually equal to the variance of the population divided by n. So standard error, right, when we square root both sides, this is going to be the variance of the uh, standard error of the population divided by the square root of n, right? So that, that's the only thing. but. Um, this will give us that nice inverse relationship. As n goes up, as n becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, you're dividing the, um, the population standard deviation by a bigger and bigger number, therefore resulting in a smaller and smaller and smaller standard error, right? As well as the opposite. As n gets smaller and smaller and smaller, let's, let's consider the n of 1, right? When n is 1, we know that the standard error precisely equals the standard deviation of the population. And let's just think about that in our heads. If we're actually getting just an n of 1 from the population, then we'd end up sampling the population exactly as it looks. Right? It would like be dropping down the same thing. right? And because of that, the standard deviation would be the same, the mean would be the same, not only that, but the shape would be the same as the shape of the population. It wouldn't be normal. So it's helpful to think about the special case when n equals 1, right? And you would never, I mean, in statistics, you would never sample an n of just 1 because that's not helpful to us. Um, we really uh, get more out of um, the central limit theorem when n is larger and larger and larger. Okay. So um, this is the central limit theorem, sort of in a nutshell. Um, and this is going to be helpful to us because now we don't need a large number of simulations. Because in, these, uh, in, in a lot of the simulations we are looking at, the simulations sort of matter, right? Like how many simulations you do. Um, what's nice about the fact that they've just proven the central limit theorem, also we might call it the CLT, um, is that now we could just skip directly to these principles without having to actually do computer-based simulations. But the computer-based simulations are helpful for us just to be able to see and know uh, where the central limit theorem comes from empirically. Um, all right.